go to hymn number 20. Hymn number 20. Now, we sing it a little bit faster, so you ladies, you guys like to hold it out. Follow my hand now, okay? <laughs> Here we go. Number 20. I have a home beyond the river. You may be seated. Um, girls, you want to come up? We got girls going to sing a couple songs for us before the preacher comes. Uh, just a couple things. If you do want to sing a special this week, get with Brother Adam. Okay, Brother Adam, where are you? Where are you at? There he is. See over there. He'll have a list. He'll be able to organize this uh, special. So if you want to sing a special this week, I know we usually have a lot, and we'll try to do our best to get everybody a chance to sing. If you want to sing, get with Brother Adam. And then also, uh, starting services tomorrow morning, make sure you're sitting with your teams. So counselors, make sure your teams are all together for services. Okay? All right, that's it. You girls ready?
Welcome, everybody, to 2021 Youth Camp. What a blessing. Man, that, that was a great video. I don't know. I got a couple movie stars in my church now. I'm going to have to watch out because Hollywood's going to probably try to get them. Uh, I don't know where they got the idea for that video, but that was a great thing. Uh, we're here this week to have fun. That's what we're here to do and get a little bit closer to the Lord. Uh, had a bad year last year. Uh, the, you know, the devil took some things away from us, but we're here this time. We're going to have some fun. Uh, one thing, be careful. They got a new drone. They call it, I think, Eyes in the Sky. And you liable to be on a movie video, too. This thing can fly four miles away, and it can sneak up on you at any time and catch you when you're not the least, I mean, when you're the least expecting that thing there and catch you. So if you're doing anything wrong, it may end up on a video. Uh, Zach has been flying it. He's been practicing with it. He knows exactly what to do with it. And he's back there shaking his hand going, yes, man, yes. So all day long, he's going to be looking for somebody uh, to take. So anyways, with that said, uh, glad you're here today. Uh, enjoy the week. Just let everything go away. Forget about everything. Just let it all go away. Focus in on this week. Uh, Dr. Peacock's got some great messages, I'm sure, for us. And uh, so I'm going to turn it over to him right now. Doc. It sure is good to be back. You want to stand up for just a second? Just wanted to see if you'd be obedient. Just want you to stretch out for a minute or two and maybe give you a couple of things here as we get started. I appreciate the privilege of being back and have the opportunity to preach to you. Uh, might be a little bit different, probably not uh, the, the typical things. At least we'll see how things begin to unwind and unveil. But you're living in what I believe to be the last days, and I know preachers have been saying that since way back in the 1920s, and I even believe the Apostle Paul was looking for the Lord to come, but whether or not he comes with the rapture, I don't believe the church is going to go through the tribulation, but I do believe that the church may face tribulation more so than we're facing it now, and if that's going to be the case, your personal individual relationship with Jesus Christ is going to be the single most important thing in your life. Now, I want you to clearly understand that I believe in winning souls. I think that's a huge thing, and I think it's very, very important. But you know what I've learned? I've learned if your relationship is right with the Lord, you'll be surprised how often you'll tell other people about Jesus because you and Jesus are in good shape. I've found that two things tend to drop off when your relationship isn't what it ought to be. Number one, you stop telling other people, and number two, you quit singing. And so whenever I begin to see that in my own personal life, I realize what needs to be done is, is I don't need another class on how to win a soul. I've been saved now for nearly 60 years, so I know a little bit about winning souls. I've won one or two in my lifetime uh, doing things better than I'm already doing. It is not what the problem is. When I stop being concerned for souls, it's indicative in my life of not having my relationship where it ought to be. And so what I want to try to do is, is if the theme this week is supposed to be about rebuilding, we have to take a survey of our own personal life and find out if anything is broken down. Now, first of all, you're to be congratulated or you're to be patted on the back or appreciated for the fact that you spent money and you're willing to come over here to come to camp for a few days. You're going to have five days out here in the hot sun and, and sleeping. And if you're in the boys' cabin, you're going to be sleeping in a sewer by Wednesday. Um, things are going to be really bad and the smell of sweat and Lord only knows what uh, to be in there. The girls might fare a little bit better, but by the end of the week you're going to be physically tired and you're going to be emotionally kind of unwound. And what I want to do is try to start off tonight, just give you a few things, uh, not put a lot of pressure on you, just to give you a few things, more like a Sunday school lesson, uh, just to sort of set some things up. You may want to take a note or two because we'll sort of continue to refer to it, but it's going to be about your individual relationship. Uh, I'm not in the sense of a team builder in trying to reach you corporately. I found that if I can reach you individually, you'll wind up making a corporate effort together once you get your relationship right with the Lord. If you have a problem with your brothers or sisters in Christ, it usually means you have a problem with you and the Lord first. So I can't fix the problem between you and you. You're supposed to love God before you love the brethren, right? Are you in Nehemiah chapter number 1? Did I give you that yet? Let's go to Nehemiah chapter number 1. 
And let me give you a couple of things right out of the book of Nehemiah. Um, Ezra comes along and he begins to rebuild the temple. And then Nehemiah comes along and his friend comes to him. And I'll just give you these verses and then we're going to pray and have a seat. And we're going to walk through the pages of the passage here. And I'll give you a couple of things about what to expect if you want to rebuild. Rebuilding's a good thing. The place where we're staying, and I've been staying there for years, and I'm glad that my wife was able to make it up here this time, and it's a blessing to have her with me, but uh, they have remodeled, rebuilt, redone that whole place, and it's, uh, it's fresh, and it's clean, and it's nice, and, uh, and it'll be a pleasurable stay, if not even somewhat relaxing, except for the pressure of the meeting. But you know what you have to do? You have to evaluate what it is that needs to be rebuilt, and then the cost thereupon. So if I come in and I look at something and I see a hole in a wall and I'm thinking, oh, okay, well, that's a little bit of drywall and maybe a, a one by, I mean, a two by four and a couple of nails and stuff like that, that's different than having to redo the entire roof. There's a cost associated with what needs to be rebuilt, but you can't go over there and think, well, I need to fix the wall so I'll replace the roof. You have to know what it is that needs rebuilding. What's broken down in your life? It requires a personal accountability, if not a personal autopsy of your own spiritual life. Now you do this, I know you're standing, just give me a, just a moment or two here. Uh, I, and you do this when it comes to your physical. You don't feel well, you go to see the doctor. Or you go on WebMD or you go talk to somebody because you know you're coughing or you got a fever, especially with this stuff that just passed by. Every time somebody got the sniffles, they thought they were going to die. I'm not making light of it. I lost a friend of mine that I've had for 45 years. I realize it's the real deal and I'm not even here to talk about all that. My point is, is that physically you know when something's not the way that it ought to be. So you go to see a doctor for a checkup. Why? Well, because it could just be the sniffles, or it could be the virus, or it could be the beginning of pneumonia, or it could be cancer. You don't know until you go see. So if you treat cancer and think it's, I mean, treat a cold, but you think it's cancer, or vice versa, you treat the cold and it winds up being cancer, the wrong diagnosis could kill you. This isn't a one-size-fits-all. This means that every one of us have certain things in our Christian life that are in need of repair. So look if you will please and then we'll be seated after uh, Brother Joe Bono prays for us. The Bible says this in verse number 2, And Hananiah, one of my brethren, came and certain men of Judah and asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left of the captivity concerning Jerusalem. And they said unto me, The remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in a great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Watch his response. Verse number four. And it came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Brother Joe, you pray, would you please, and ask the Lord to help us out. Amen. Thank you. You can have a seat. Thank you for standing. Let me start off right off the bat is it bothered him that something was broken down. There's no point in me trying to change you. I do not believe that you can force feed Christians, nor do I believe you can force spirituality. For years, unfortunately, we as preachers, we did it with the right heart, but probably the wrong uh, method of doing things. Our motivation might have been re uh, right, but our, our, our methods were messed up. And we thought if we could get outward conformity that that would turn you into spiritual beings. So as long as you dress right and look right and you're high and tight and all that, and I'm not saying that you shouldn't have standards in living, it applies everywhere in life. Many of you know that I was a policeman for a number of years and they didn't care anything at all about what I thought about how I should dress. 
When I went to work for them, they said, if you're going to work here, you're going to wear this uniform, you're going to wear your collar brass this way, you're going to wear your badge this way, you're going to wear your name tag this way. I mean, in the academy, they actually brought out a ruler and measured it. And if it was wrong, they would snatch it off, and then you'd run six miles at lunch and then have to repolish everything and put it back on. Now, before you get upset, you have to understand that when I was in training, they were not interested in whether or not it hurt my feelings. They were interested in me doing what, allowed, what, what I was required to do in order to obtain what I wanted to do, which was graduate from the academy and beat a policeman. But oftentimes in the Christian life, we think that if we get the outward conformity of an individual, everything must be all right on the, out, on the inside. But the truth is, is that some of you know how to play that game. You've been raised in church. You know how to act in church and you know what to do. But on the inside, you're messed up as a soup sandwich. Now, who can fix you? Well, preachers, believe it or not, and we've got some really good preachers and really good pastors, and they love the Lord, and they believe the book, and they're very well studied, and they're very well prepared, but none of them can see in your heart like the Holy Spirit can. They might see indicators, they might see things, and they might guess at uh, what might be going on, but they don't have the diagnostics the Holy Spirit does to be able to tell you why they think you're under conviction. Generally, people uh, preach or they oftentimes counsel out of their own experience, and sometimes they can give you the wrong diagnosis. So the first thing you have to be willing to do is, is number one, the wall's broken down, the, the walls are, are, are broken down, and the city is burned with fire, and does it bother you at all? Because if your walls are broken down and things are beginning to come through the walls, and we'll just say that the walls are the fleshly things that are there, your eyes, your ears, your, your, your nose, your mouth, your, your sense of touch and feel and so on and so forth, those five kings that guard those gates and stuff, maybe those gates and walls are down right now. Maybe the walls are crumbled and the gates are burned with fire and the enemy is just coming in and you're letting all kind of things come into your life now. Because what I have learned is during this past year, many people out of sheer boredom sat down on a regular basis and messed around with social media and messed around with YouTube, messed around with the television and met because they couldn't go anywhere, they couldn't do anything. At least there, I mean, we had a pretty decent governor down there, but our people were still somewhat restricted. They wouldn't even let you go to a restaurant and people were so freaked out like when you had food delivered at your house they're like spraying the black bag with bleach or something because they're they're like you know they don't want to get cooties and they don't want to get your cooties and you go to walk out the door to get it and they're like stand back you know and it's like it's my food well I'll leave it on the step don't come out here it's like I, I, I mean I you know would you please wear a mat it's my house I'm not you know no well you know so they leave it on the steps it's like 15 feet from me and then they run down the driveway and they get in their car and burn rubber and pull it out of the driveway and that kind of a thing because it's like you know I, he might have the he might have the, the the virus what I'm talking about is is because of the situation or circumstances which is unprecedented that you were put in during the last year oftentimes what happens out of boredom you start allowing things to come in that routine in life wouldn't normally allow. Well, I'd be in school, I'd be in church, I would be in activities, I'd be in athletics, I would be uh, busy all the time going to my job and doing other things. But because everything was shut down, guess what happened? All of a sudden the walls began to crumble and the things that, you know, used to not be right, all of a sudden it's like, well, you know, a little bit doesn't hurt after all. It's COVID. I'm so sick of hearing everything blamed on COVID. Everything, in Florida at least, everything is blamed. You know, there's a fish float, must be COVID. No, the fish died because the fish was old or the fish got hooked or the fish. No, it must be COVID. Everything, you have a traffic jam, it's COVID. You don't have a traffic jam, it's COVID. Throw the ball back just a little bit, it goes by a little bit faster. But when instead of, instead of looking at our life as a Christian and recognizing that because we were in that type of a situation, it's like, well, you know, mom, dad, what do you expect me to do? Well, so you're flipping through the channels and flipping through the channels, and before you'd flip through the channels and it'd be like, you know, I shouldn't be watching that. And then all of a sudden it's like the Holy Spirit gets grieved, he gets quenched, but the first thing he does is he sticks you a little bit, right? It's like, whoa, what are you doing there? And you're like, well, it's COVID. And he's like, well, I don't care, it's still wrong. But 
After a while, the walls begin to crumble. Things begin to, to come down. And the gates get burned up with fire. And I got a bunch of notes in there that say, you know, the fires of your own lust and your own desires and, and your own uh, optimism and all the other kind of things. But the bottom line is, is that once those gates are burned, you can't reconstruct you. You've got to build new gates. The gates are burned with fire. You don't want to try to put up a gate that's been burned with fire to put it back up there because it's not going to give you the protection that's there. While I understand all you kids, ladies, gentlemen, whatever you'd like me to call you this week, uh, I, I understand that uh, oftentimes we use gates in a negative sense. How about we use them as a positive sense to say God gave you eyes for the right things. I'm glad I can read my Bible and I'm glad that I can watch the things I should watch and I'm glad I can listen to the girls singing tonight. I like to have my ear. I love having my ears. Now we have a blind man that I know was in our, well, that's in our classes. He's graduating and that kind of a thing and he's blind. I mean literally he can't see anything at all and I just spent a little bit of time with him talking about a number of things. You know what it made me realize? Man, thank the Lord for a Bible. Thank the Lord for my eyes to be able to read the Bible and God help me when I put something in my eyes I had no business putting in my eyes. Are you understanding me so far? But during COVID we got lax and the walls came down. And things slipped a little bit. And whether you warmed back up slowly, I don't know what your pastors did and how they did it, but it was different in every state and in every county and every state and every city and every state. And everybody did something different and everybody thought whatever they did was the right way for everybody else to do it. But the bottom line is now we're all back. You know, and preachers are, you know, well, I wouldn't do that. Well, I would do this. Well, if he does that, he's a compromiser. And, well, I think this and I think that and all that kind of stuff. Well, they don't live where you live and they're not dealing with your people. The bottom line is, is that now here all of you are and I don't see any robbers in the bunch. You know, wear a mask. Wow. In, in my day, if somebody was putting on a mask, somebody was fixing to get hurt or shot because it's like, okay, we know what you're up to, right? And then it became very common, everybody wore a mask. But of course it was a plot by the CIA to be able to bring in uh, facial recognition software so that they could recognize you. And then it was a demonic plot because it was a demonic satanic thing to take away or wipe out your identity to turn you into a zombie to follow after the Antichrist. I've heard pretty much one end to the other of what all it was and whether you agree or don't agree with CDC and all the other uh, people that said all the things that they said about it. The bottom line is this because I am digressing we let some things in we shouldn't have let in we got a little too relaxed we got a little too easy on sinful things and we let our walls come down and we let the gates get burned with fire now here's step number one that's the most important of all these steps because if this step doesn't take place in your life there's nothing that can be done about it Nehemiah sat down and he wept and he mourned and he prayed and he fasted because it bothered him that the walls were down and the gates were burned. I should be able to say that's the end of the sermon right there because you know what I know? If it doesn't bother you that the walls are down and the gates are burned, there's no help in you. What I have after this is to show you how to rebuild the stuff and to tell you what to expect when you get ready to rebuild. But too often, ladies and gentlemen, the bottom line is, is that it doesn't bother us anymore. I don't know if y'all are infiltrated up here with queers like we are back in Florida. Florida's like a magnet for, 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 for queers. I did pretty good there. Now, now see, that your reaction to that bothers me. They call themselves queers. They got every letter in the alphabet now. And then when I say that, you've been so infiltrated that you're beginning to think, well, because you're going to school with them and they're nice people and, and they're really not that bad. And I mean, they're just a little bit, you know, they're kind of designer minded and they're so creative. And, you know, or, or if they're lesbos, they're like, hey, how you doing? I'm going to play football. It's like... And they got on brogans, and you, and you can't tell, but your response to that is, is I'm not saying you mock, belittle, or make fun of them, but that's still an abomination. 
I had a guy give me some information the other day from a very, very well-known psychiatrist and he supposedly is walking through the Bible and I say that literally sarcastically. And you know what he said? I don't believe in my account and using my educational background and looking at the so-called literary classic of Sodom and Gomorrah, I do not believe that God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah because of homosexuality. Well, you're smoking crack. Because that's what exactly he did and also Adma and Zeboam. Four cities he wiped out because of queers. Now, here's the only, here's what, I'm just using that as an illustration. I'm not going to slam queers all week because hopefully they're not there. And if they're in the closet, stay in the closet all week. We don't want you out. Amen. No rainbow flags around here. Right? But here's what I want you to see. Your response to that. Because during the past year, that stuff has been driven and driven and driven and driven and driven to where it's become normal. It's like, yeah, it's on YouTube and it's on TV and it's on social media and your friends and other people are putting up posts of themselves with Mr. Rainbow Hair and Miss Whatever She Is and that kind of a thing. And you know what happens? The walls come down and then eventually it's like, well, I mean, I'm not going to be that way. But you know, I mean, they're really nice people. They're queer. It's wrong. You know, so a guy comes to me and says, you don't know what it's like. I have one in my family. I said, okay, I pray for you. I, I really, I mean, I mean it sincerely. I'm not making fun, but, but it's still wrong. You know, just because it's in your family doesn't, well, are we going to change the Bible? Well, yeah, we got to change the Bible because I see things differently now. Does God see things differently? Are you with me so far? Number one, does it bother you? If it doesn't bother you, then take a nap. I mean, really, you're going to need it throughout the rest of this week because you're not going to sleep anymore. So use church to sleep tonight because I can't help you. <clears throat> Number two, you've got to be willing to do something about it yourself. Nehemiah said, Lord, Lord, me. Let me. Help me. He said, I. I. I'm willing to go. David comes back to Ziklag and he sees the city burn and they spake of stoning him. And David prays to the Lord there and the Lord brings the ephod and the preacher over there and he prays to him, that kind of thing. And they said, we're going to stone you. And David said, well, I'm going after the ones that did this if I have to go by myself. They bring in the ark up of the ark of the covenant up over there. The David brings it the second time in there after he brought the cart in. And the Bible says David danced alone. David faced Goliath alone. I'm saying that you have to make a decision to be an individual. If you're that much of a rebel and you're always rebelling against everything, why don't you rebel against yourself when you choose to sin and when you choose to do wrong? If you're that much, why don't you put that rebel maverick spirit to good use and why don't you put your foot down and say, I am sick and tired of me. This is not one of these self-help kind of a deals where it's kind of like, I'm okay and you're okay. No, I'm not okay. The biggest enemy I have is not my wife, it is not my church, it is not the brethren. It is me, and me, me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. And until we recognize and until it bothers us and until you stop pointing fingers at everybody else like Tobias fixing to do in just a minute and recognize I'm the problem. If I can get me fixed, you'd be surprised how much more tolerant you will be of other people and how much more loving and caring you will be when it comes to other people. But you will be absolutely astonished at the difference in your relationship with Jesus Christ when you come before him and the Lord said, who are you? Lord, I'm great, I'm wonderful, I mean, you know, I'm the queen of the ball, I'm the king of the ball, I'm, I'm as good as it gets. Possibly the Lord said, can't do nothing for you. I like people like Jacob. My name's Jacob. I'm a supplanter. I'm a liar. I'm a cheater. I'm a con man. I, I like people like Bartimaeus. What do you want me to do for you? Lord, I'm blind. I need help. I'm like Legion in Mark chapter number 5. What's your name? My name's Legion. Doesn't God know? Sure God knows what his name is. He knows his name is Legion. But God wants to know, do you see yourself like he sees you? At the judgment seat of Christ, contrary to popular belief, you're not going to be up there and everybody's going to vote on whether you should or shouldn't get a crown and good or should or shouldn't get some gold and should or shouldn't get some silver and precious stones and should or shouldn't rule and reign and this and that. And no, you're going to face off with him and give an account of yourself. Every man at the judgment seat of Christ will give account of himself unto God for the work that he did in the body, whether it be good or bad. That's you personally accountable for your own actions. He doesn't hold everybody else accountable. 
And until we accept the fact that we need to work on ourselves, nobody in here unless Jesus is present is perfect. Every one of us has enough fleas on us to remind us of the dog we are if we're just willing to bark. And if we would do that, you could see revival at a youth camp. That would be insurmountable. But the problem in churches and stuff right now, it's always them. It's always him. It's always the Marthas. Lord, I don't know what Mary thinks she's doing. She's trying to get some help. She's sitting down here at my feet. Lord, but I, I mean, she needs to be in the kitchen making biscuits and tater salad and, and helping me out. But Lord, I can't have revival unless Mary is doing what I'm doing. Nope, wrong attitude. Lord, it's me. In the book of Isaiah, chapter number 6, I'm coming through your passage here in just a minute. In Isaiah, chapter number 6, the Bible says, In the year King Uzziah died, we'll be here later on in the week, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. Didn't mean Uzziah had not, I mean, didn't mean that Isaiah hadn't been going to church. It meant that as long as Uzziah is alive, it prevents you from seeing God because Uzziah is a picture of us. And Uzziah has to get out of the way so you can see the Lord. And then guess what happens in the passage? You might be surprised. Isaiah, when he sees the Lord, he says, I am uh, unclean and I dwell in the midst of unclean people. I'm not only unclean, but I'm having fellowship with the wrong people. When Elijah comes over there in 2 Kings or 1 Kings, he gets ready in 1 Kings chapter number 19 to have the showdown at the OK Corral there, or 1 Kings 18. And they're getting ready to do that. You know what's happened to the nation of Israel? They've compromised so much that not only is their altar broken down, but they're sitting at the table eating with Jezebel. So if you want to write this one down, you can write it. If you ain't going to get up from the table this week, then don't expect to get fed because the stuff I have to feed you doesn't come from Jezebel's table. It comes from God's table. It has nothing to do with my ability as a preacher or, or some kind of thing. It's, it has to do with you being personally accountable for your own spiritual condition. And you're as close to God right now as you honestly want to be. Now I'm assuming, and I know what it is, the nomenclature and all that makes an ass out of you and me and all that kind of a stuff like that. I can make assumptions. I can look at things with reasonable suspicion or even probable cause. And I can say you wouldn't be at a camp, at least a good portion of you, unless you recognize I need to have some time away, not just to play and have some sports and to have a good time and to meet other kids and so on and so forth, but I need some spiritual reflection. I think we need a resurgence of camp for adults. I think we ought to have adults come if they could kick it out of gear and spend five days doing what you're doing. I think what we should do is bring them in and preach to them and then let them play and let them eat and then preach to them and let them play and let them eat. And then but you couldn't get adults to play and eat together. That's all for kids. Part of the reason that some of you are whacked out as a soup sandwich is is because you're watching too many of us adults and we don't have it down pat either. But I want you to understand, if you're not willing to look at yourself and number two, recognize I need some help, then there's not going to be any help. Look, when you get sick, you can lay in the bed all day long if you want to and if you get tired of getting sick, what do you usually do? You get up and go to the doctor, right? You're going to have to get up and come to Jesus. Nehemiah says, Lord, I'm willing to go alone. I'm willing to do it by myself. He comes before the king, and it's bothering him so much. There's an emotional component. The king asks him when he's a cupbearer for the king. He walks up to the king there, and he gets ready to hand him. This is a story. It's actually a literary classic, but it's a true story of a guy that's a cupbearer for a king. And you're walking in the presence of a king who literally can just speak or look a funny way and take your head off. And so the king says to Nehemiah, he says, what's the matter with your countenance? And Nehemiah said, I'm, I'm, really, I'm really bothered by what's going on, but I realize that the task ahead of me can't be accomplished unless I, number three, get somebody to help me. You can look at yourself and know you need help, but you're going to have to be willing to admit some things you've got to have help to be able to overcome. That's why you need your preachers. That's why you need your pastors. Now, I'm going to just put in a little word here. If your preachers or your pastors are here, when was the last time you wrote them a note and said, hey, I appreciate it? Now, they're going to be mad at me. And I, oh, don't be telling them that and that kind of a deal. But you know what? There is nothing that fills a pastor's heart more than to know you appreciate the fact that he's trying to help you. But we're messed up too. But we're trying. Are you trying? If you're not going to try, you're never going to be able to do anything. 
Spiritually, every one of you may have different gifts, but you all have the benefit and the privilege of being able to walk closer to Jesus Christ than anybody else if you're just willing to pay the price. All right, so let's look in the passage here. That's it as far as the, the setup. That's the entrance. That's the foyer. That's coming into the way. That's just the practical things that happen. Uh, number four, if you're keeping numbers and so on and so forth, when you get ready to go get some help, you have to look in chapter number two, look in verse number 10. Look what happens. When Sambalat the Hornite and Tobiah the servant of the Ammonite heard it, it grieved them exceedingly that there was come a man to seek the welfare of the children of Israel. And they came to Jerusalem, and verse number 12, arose in the night, and I and some few men with me, neither told I any man what God had put in my heart to do. And they came by night, and they viewed the walls that were broken down. In verse number 13, the gates thereof, they're consumed with fire, and they get ready to do something. There's no place that's found there. In verse number 14, with the king's pool, but there is no place for the, for the beast and soul, no, no barns, nothing. It's in a terrible place. Look what happens in verse number 19. But when Sambalat the Hornite and Tobiah the servant of the Ammonite and Geshem the Arabian heard it, they laughed us to scorn and despised us and said, What is this thing that ye will do? We will rebel against the king. Preacher, what's going to happen? When you start trying to move closer to Jesus, you're going to have to expect opposition. I know you think that's odd. <laughs> There's going to be even some kids at camp they're going to make fun of you because you want to get up a little early and read your Bible or you want to get alone and pray. Or if you're going to have after meeting meetings, they're going to be in a big hurry to hurry up and go get a cow tail as opposed to sitting down on their tail and listen to, hey, you know, let me tell you what I found out. You have to grow up and recognize that's part of the Christian life. There's no preacher, no pastor here that has done any work for a year or more that has not faced both spiritual and physical opposition, including in their own family, with their own wife and kids. It's part of what comes with the territory, and I wish that it was an easy, breezy deal and it was just wind in your sails, but the fact of the matter is, is you need to be prepared to understand that if you're going to get closer to God, you're going to get closer to the devil. And he does not care if you sit on your blessed assurance and do absolutely nothing. He will leave you alone. He loves carnal Christians. He loves lazy Christians. He loves Christians that don't want to know any more about Jesus. But the minute you recognize, I got a problem, I need to rebuild my walls, and I need to repair my gates, and I need to get some things in place, you trust me, you're going to be laughed to scorn. You're going to be made fun of. You're going to be mocked. When you first start building, they're going to say, you can't build. Ever go back from camp before and you're all in fire, man, and you're all jacked up and ready to go, man, and you're, you know, you're shouting and all that, and when you get back, you have some adults say, it won't last. It's like throwing a wet blanket on you, isn't it? You know, it's kind of like, you know, you're getting ready for a ball game and you're trying to kind of get up in your head, basketball, football, whatever it might be, and, and you're kind of getting up and kind of, and, and you're facing, you know, the Goliath of the football teams, and there's somebody in the stands going, you'll never win. Well, well at least I'm trying. But you have to recognize you can't let that deter you. But I'm telling you it's coming. I'm telling you it'll happen at camp. And if guess what? If it's not somebody sitting around you, it'll be yourself. Anybody here ever, th this is rhetorical, don't raise your hands. Anybody ever go on a diet? Here's a good one for you. You ever fast? I recommend you try it, not just for health reasons and because it's so good and it causes the red blood cells to clean up after the white blood cells. And then all of a sudden it eats up. Like, oh, no, 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 I'm talking about, I'm talking about a spiritual fast. I fast every Sunday from 12 o'clock when I get through preaching until 1 o'clock when I get to the dinner table. <laughs> but when I decide to fast, you know, I get these wild ideas. I'm, I'm going to fast for seven days. Seven in the Bible, number for completeness. That's God's number all through Revelation, all the sevens. After seven minutes, I'm like, Oh, I'm really hungry. I just ate breakfast. How many? How much longer do we have to go? You got six days and 23 hours and 53 minutes. When you're fasting, all of a sudden it's kind of like everything slows down and then food begins to take on like this. And it's like talking to you. You go by the refrigerator. It opens the doors on its own. And it's like, don't you want some of this? It's good for you. 
And you're like, no, I'm fasting. And it begins to pull on you and it begins to tug on you. And guess what? The opposition is not demonic, it's your own flesh. You ever come off sugar? Here's a good one for you. You ever come off of caffeine? Whoa, that's a really good one there. <laughs> and all of a sudden your body's like, I'm going to tell you what to do. When you choose to make a spiritual decision, kids, if you'll listen to me, your own self is going to oppose it because you're going to have to put your flesh down and there's things that your flesh wants to do that spiritually are not good for you to do physically. You have to grab control of your eyes and your ears and everything else that has to do with the five kings that run your life. Because when that sixth king steps in and wants to take over those five kings, those five kings are going to fight you. And you need to be aware of that. So before you start worrying about everybody else laughing, you know what your own self, you're going to tell yourself, you've done this before. You've been down there to that altar. You've been down there 14 times. It ain't changed you yet. Well, no, I'm, but I'm still going. You know, a fellow said one time to a guy, he started working out. He'd been working out a couple of weeks. He said, you ain't changed. He said, well, I'm still going. Listen, you don't, you don't bench 400 overnight. You have to keep going. You can't just go because I go. Why? Because I'm making it a habit of going and because I'm trying to learn a process. I had a process for a long time. It just worked for me because I'm very hard-headed. One of the things that I would do is go to the altar, and I went to the altar a lot because my, just because my flesh didn't like it. And I know that maybe sounds a little bit carnal, but I mean, I didn't care. But then it was, I, I began to learn, my flesh began to learn, you buck too hard, he's going to take you right down and embarrass you. It's embarrassing sometimes to go to the altar, especially if the preacher's preaching on drinking, and there's somebody sitting in the crowd, and invariably what will happen is he's preaching on drinking, the Lord will say, come on, let's go to the altar. I'm like, and then you go down there, and that old lady will go, I, I'm so glad, Brother Peacock, he's an old sot drunk. You know, I'm just glad that he's finally getting him straight with alcohol. But it embarrasses your flesh. You're going to have opposition. You're going to have difficulty. Come to Nehemiah chapter 4. Let me put a bow on this thing for you. And notice that once they start going, there's not only opposition. Then people are laughing and mocking and belittling and, and making fun. When they start working, it looks as if the task is bigger than their abilities to handle it. He says in that passage there, doesn't he say, look, man, not only are they making fun of us, and not only did they say when we rebuild it, the foxes will run on it and tear it up. But look in there, he says, there's just too much rubbish. There's just too much to try to get out of the way before I can rebuild. There's too much that has to be cleared out of the way. I, I, he said it specifically. He says there's too much rubbish. Do you see that in Nehemiah 4? Is that 4? Am I on it? 14, 15, somewhere there? 10. Nehemiah 4, 10. Like 410 shotgun. Right? So here's whatever number this is. When you get ready to move toward the Lord, there's going to be opposition. It has to bother you. You want to change. You want to do something better. You're going to recognize there's going to be some opposition. There's a big task. And the first thing that's going to happen is the devil's going to remind you of the rubbish in your past. Forget about everybody else reminding you. You know what he's going to do? There's too much rubbish. The Lord can't do nothing with you. You're, you're tainted. You're ruined already. You've already been messed up. You've done some horrible, god-awful, terrible things. I told you at that time about that young girl that was in the prison and the old preacher was preaching and, and when she came up after the thing was over with, I thought she was going to get saved and she didn't pray and ask the Lord to save her. And, and when I dealt with her there, I was rolling them up and, and rolling the picture up there and, and uh, I, I just mentioned to her, she said, don't hurt him. And I said, he's seated at the right hand of the Father, ever lived to make intercession for you, blah, blah, blah. And, and she said, uh, uh, well, he couldn't clean me up. And I quoted the scripture, though your sins be as scarlet, they be white as a wool, though they be red like crimson, they shall be as snow. And she said, you don't know what I've done. I said, it doesn't make any difference. He can forgive you of it and clean you up. She's a meth head. She had old black burnt popcorn teeth. She had skin poppers all over her. She was 21 or 22 years of age. She looked every bit of 40 or better. Skin and bones just, just I mean, and, and just stunk. Her, her mouth was rotten. Her skin was rotten. She had all kind of stuff all over her. Can't clean me up. Well, he may not clean you up on the outside, but he can clean you on the inside. 
I called that chaplain over there, and she sat down there with her, a good chaplain. Chaplain Westmore had been there at that time about 30 years, and she had dealt with these girls, and before long that girl slid off of that bench there, and all the other girls had gone back, and she asked the Lord to save her, and then the correctional officer came in and, and hollered at him for account, and so the chaplain said, I'm bringing her to you, just give me a second, and they walked out this way, and I got up and grabbed the easel and stuff, and I said, hey, sister, I said, hey, did you, did you get anything straightened out? And she turned around, you could see the glistening tears running down her cheeks. And through those old burnt popcorn teeth and that foul breath, you know what she said? She said, I'm clean now. Now, she still went to prison for what she did. And she still had to overcome her addictions with meth and two or three other things. But the bottom line is, is that one of the difficult things in your own life is, is sometimes you're too hard on yourself for your failures. There is nobody in here that has not messed up. I'm not condoning messing up. Learn a lesson from your mistakes and don't repeat them. And don't do stupid things and don't have the testimony that you have to be bad to have a good testimony. Are you hearing me, guys? Don't, don't stand up when you give a testimony. Say, hey, I did some very bad things. Thank God for the blood of Jesus Christ and talk about Jesus. Don't go through all of the things that you did. And don't be telling everybody, putting them on Facebook because that metadata is out there from now on. And right when you start coming along, you know what somebody's going to do? They're going to say, didn't you do this? And there's your picture with you and the guys and having a few beers and smoking some dope and, you know, all this and that and the other. Don't, don't do that to yourself. You're shooting yourself in the foot. But suppose you have. You say, what do you do? You get down and say, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner, and I sure am sorry I did all that, and I've, I've done some horrible and some terrible things. Go ahead and own it, but stop being proud of it. Don't dabble in it. Don't think that you're a failure beyond recovery. Don't think just because you've made some mistakes that you get known for your mistakes and you get identified by your mistakes as opposed to getting identified by who you are in Jesus Christ. Look, the Apostle Paul comes out when he goes to trial right before he gets his head chopped off when he gets sent over to Rome and all that. You know what the Apostle Paul, they come out and says, you, you've killed all these people, you've jailed all these people in the name of religion. You went over here and you've made widows out of women and orphans out of children and all that. You know what Paul said? You're right, I did it. But then he immediately goes, but I met Jesus on the road to Damascus. And what I used to be, I'm not now. And then he starts bragging about what Jesus has done for him since that, to the point that, guess what? The big shots say, you know something, Paul? You're either mad or the other one says, you almost persuaded me to be a Christian. Because his testimony became about what Jesus had done for him, not what he had done in the past. Everybody has a past. But it's better if you can build on something that you don't have to clear the rubbish first. Don't make your own rubbish. Does that make sense? Don't, don't make your own trash pile. You don't have to do that. Preacher, you know everybody has to sin. No, no, you don't have to sin. If you're saved, you have victory over that. If you're saved, you don't ha you're not under the law of sin anymore. You now have in you the ability. No temptation taken you with such as common to man. The Lord with the temptation provide for you a way of what? But the issue is you have to take the escape route. If all of a sudden there's a fire in here, God forbid if there was. But it's interesting, they have green now, not red. Did you notice that? That's a new building code. Do you know why? There's something in your mind that has a tendency to not be able to read letters when you're under stress, so you don't read, so you go by colors. What color means go? What color means stop? So they're changing them from red to green. Do you know why? You can see green better than red in smoke. Do you know why? Because if you're melting down and you've got auditory exclusion and you've got tunnel vision, Green means go. <laughs> so I'm going out, what does red do? Don't come this way. And some of you choose not to learn that lesson. That's why they have a red stoplight. The red doesn't mean go. And yellow doesn't mean speed up. <laughs> Just say it. But green means to go. You know what you have to be willing to do? Don't make your own rubbish. You don't have to live the life that everybody says you have to live and experience all of these things. But trust me when I tell you, and having done what I've done before, you put scars there that relieve, that bring scar tissue, and those scars bother you the rest of your life. But especially when you get ready to rebuild. You've 
messed up too many times. God can't use you. God can't do anything with you. Did you ever look at who God does stuff with in the Bible? Moses was a stinking basket case. I paused for effect there. <laughs> Moses was a basket case. Yeah. My wife tells me, if you have to explain it, it's not funny. I said, but they laugh when I explain it. She said, it's a pity laugh. <laughs> Moses was messed up. Moses killed a man, buried him in the sand, right? And then was out of the will of God for 40 years. At 80 years of age, he runs into the burning bush. Who would have thought? He's, a, he's washed up. Not only that, he stuttered. And he's an old man. I mean, I can't imagine what it would be like to be 80 just at my age right now. It's kind of like, wow, things are not where they're supposed to be anymore. You know, your chest runs down to your drawers and all this other kind of stuff. And you have a hard time seeing your toes and, and things are different. Blood alone bend over to touch your toes. That's why I wear slip-ons. Lace and shoes, it's kind of like getting harder every day. You can try to sit down and get to it. And then you try to put your legs up and, and everything in you is going, what are you doing? Stop, you're hurting me. Right? He's 80 years of age, and guess what happens? The Lord comes to him and says, you want to do something? Nothing you do, although there may be repercussions, will ever prevent you from being able to do something for the Lord if you want to do something for the Lord. Until you resolve that guilt monkey that's on you, that, listen, if the Lord forgave you, then forgive yourself. Now, I'm going to quote you one verse, and you're going to hear it a couple of times during this week. In 2 Corinthians chapter number 2, the Apostle Paul says that you, whom, to whom you forgive anything, I forgive also, unless Satan should get a, an advantage of you because we're not ignorant of Satan's devices. Now, in the passage, he's talking about you forgiving somebody else of something, but how about forgiving yourself? You can't make an atonement for what you did. There may be repercussions. You may still have to go to jail. I put a boy in jail years ago now, he was 18 years old, just turned 18, went out to a stop and rob, and he went in there to get some quick cash, and there was a little Vietnamese fellow behind the counter there, and the guy came in there, and you know he thought, you know, you throw the gun out there and, and threaten him, and the guy will just pour the money to you. Well, the guy had just come back from Vietnam, and I mean, he had been in Vietnam and stuff like that, so he was accustomed to the stuff. He reached under the counter and grabbed the gun, and when he did, he pointed it at the kid, and the kid pulled the trigger. He didn't even aim or anything, and he hit the guy literally right between the eyes, right up here in the front of the forehead. It wasn't very hard to find him. We found him down on Phillips Highway. It wasn't that much longer. They picked him up and they brought him, put him in the box, or put him in the interview room, and uh, we had him in there. And the guys were talking to him and stuff. And they got done and said, "Hey, Captain, you want to come talk to this guy?" I said, "Sure, man. I'll talk to him a little bit." And so they got done with everything and all the Miranda warnings and all the other stuff. And then he, you know, admitted what he did. And he's bawling like a baby. So I went in there and I sat and spent some time with him and I explained a few things to him about what was going to probably take place and that kind of a deal with his attorney and, and this and that and the other, whatever he wanted to do with that. <clears throat> and I said, and, and so let me ask you this, here's why I'm here. I just want to ask you, have you ever trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? And he looked up from the table. I said, I know you wouldn't expect to get a question like that here, but I said, I kind of get to ask what I want to ask. And I said, I just want to ask you, have you ever... Is there a time in your life where ever, you know, maybe at a youth camp or something like that, he goes, yeah, I, I got saved when I was a kid. Had a good testimony. I said, okay, well, the Lord will forgive you of what you've done. He killed a guy. Graveyard dead. He said, he, he'll forgive me? I said, yeah. Yeah, you ask him to forgive you, he'll forgive you. I'll be glad to pray with you if you want to pray. He got down there, man, and he kind of curled up in the fetal position, and he began to pray, and he began to shake. And, I mean, he really was remorseful, and he really cried, and he bawled and squalled, and, and he asked the Lord to forgive him. And then he got done, and he said, can I go home now? He's petrified, scared to death. And I said, you can go to your new address, Florida State Prison. Because even though the Lord forgave you, there's still repercussions for taking a man's life. He's still there. He got life in prison. And he deserves life in prison. He is very fortunate because of his age he didn't get the death penalty. Here's my point. I told him this. I said, the Lord will go with you into jail. He's not ashamed of jailbird. There's a lot of the people that he had that he used went to jail. The Lord went in the jail with him. I said, he'll go with you wherever you go. 
But I said, now you've made a mistake, and you may have to still pay for that mistake, but God can still use you. We had a guy down in Florida State Prison on death row. And he had been in there. He had committed murder and rape. Black guy. I mean, I mean black. One of the real, real dark black individual. And the first time we came in there, he comes in, and they're only allowed three pieces of literature. And he came in, and he said, he said, do you have any of them tracks? Do you have any of them tracks? Hey, boss, you got any of them tracks? And I said, well, I'd have to. He goes, you can ask the chaplain. They'll let me have all I can have. And the old preacher came up and he said, well, why do you want all these tracks? He said, what are you going to do? He goes, he goes, I take them up to the AIDS ward. He, Doc said, you, you pass them out in the AIDS ward? He said, oh, yes, sir. And Doc said, well, aren't you worried about maybe contracting that disease? You know what his response was? You mean I get out early? He never one time said, I expect to get out. He said, I deserve to be here. He said, shucks, boss, if it hadn't been for me being in here, he said, I probably would have never got saved. But he said, now that I'm saved, through two years we went there, three years we went there, every year he's there. He's still, got any more of them tracks? Got any more of them tracks? Going to the AIDS ward. God can still use you, no matter what it is. But you know what's going to happen to you? Somebody's going to tell you, too much rubbish. You've done too many wrong things. Why don't you accept the, by faith the blood of Jesus Christ to cleanse you from all sin and say, Lord, I realize I've done some things, and if I can't do that anymore, could you use me for something? Can I sweep a floor? Can I clean a toilet? Can I cut some grass? Can I clean some windows? Can I clean up in the kitchen? Can I do something? Are you with me? I'm giving you just four or five things here today just to start you down the right path. You know what happens? The Bible says the bearer of the burdens is decayed. You know why it says that? We're in the same passage right there in Nehemiah 4. You know why it says that? Because the spiritual life will exact physical fatigue on your part. You much study, the Bible says, is weariness to the flesh. I'm just trying to prepare you. Just because you're doing something spiritual doesn't mean you don't get tired. You say, why? Because it's a fight. You know what the Apostle Paul said? I fought a good fight. I kept the faith. The mistaken idea is, is that the Christian life is like getting saved. You get saved, it's instantaneous, right? You ask Jesus Christ to save you, you admit you're a sinner, you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, confess Him as your Savior, just like that instantaneously twinkling of an eye, your soul is saved. Christian life is something entirely different. It requires effort. I hate to say this word because your work does not prove you're saved and it doesn't keep you saved and it doesn't get you saved, but you know one of the things you have to do in a Christian life? You've got to work at it. Here's the odd thing to me. Adults will tell you they, that they don't believe in doing that. They believe in just coming sitting in the church house turns them into a Christian. Well, listen, going and sitting in the barn doesn't turn you into a horse. Or sitting in the garage doesn't turn you into a car. To become a Christian is different than becoming saved. To become a Christian, it requires effort. And it's fatiguing. It's tiresome. Because the world has its demands on you and the things you have to do, whether it be school, whether it be work, whether it's provision for your family, or whatever your responsibilities are. And then on top of that, you now have a responsibility to maintain your spiritual life. And there is a fight constantly. And make no mistake about it, it is a constant fight. Every time you turn around, something's running through your mind. Somebody is saying something. Somebody's wanting you to see something, boys. Somebody's wanting to tell you something. And the next thing you know, if you don't fight and you don't understand, that is physically fatiguing. You say, what happened? It gets tiresome and you want to just throw in the towel. You want to just give up. It's worth it if you keep punching. But you get tired even of doing that. Look in the passage here, and let me put a bow on the end thing here, and we'll go ahead and wind it up and go get a cow tail. But I want you to, to, <coughs> to see a couple of things here. We're in Nehemiah chapter number 4, and notice what he says. There's too much rubber, the strength is decayed. And then guess who shows up again? The adversaries. Did the Lord have adversaries? I believe he did. Did the Lord have adversaries? Did Moses fail? Did Elijah fail? Did Peter fail? Did Paul fail? You know what the Bible says? A righteous man falleth down seven times and seven times rises up again. You say, what are you trying to do? Trying to keep you going? I wish the rapture had happened tonight. I mean, literally. I mean, I wish, you know, just right now. Big explosion and we go right through the ceiling. Wouldn't that be a hoot? You know, watch all the backsliders kind of, you know, flew it and watch it's like that kind of a deal. Because we're in the right place right now, right? 
I mean, it wouldn't it be good to be in church when you know, I mean, not doing some of those other things you're doing, the Lord to come right, be, be good. Like, come now, Lord, because I'm where I need to be, right? I got caught in church. Where'd you get caught, right? But the fact of the matter is, is that we're probably going to go through another day tomorrow just like we went through today. But there needs to be some incremental changes. And what I have to be willing to do is, is tonight after everything gets quiet, as I need to sit down between me and the Lord and I need to have a conversation with him, I don't need to ask the preacher. I don't need to ask my friends. I don't need to ask other people. I need to say, Lord, is there anything in me that you don't like? that you don't appreciate, that I need to work on. You'd be surprised. He'll point out grief and bitterness and anger and wrath and strife and emulation and lust and covetousness and things you never thought of. He probably won't bring up your smoking and drinking and cussing. That's kid stuff. He'll bring up jealousy and a mean spirit and a bad attitude. But if you're willing to wrestle with that thing, like Jacob wrestled with the angel out there in the cornfield, the Lord might bless you this week. But it's entirely up to you. You can't force somebody to do it. I'm working on a thing now that I was asked to do, and the title of the deal is, is you can't train a Demas. Trying to force somebody into Christian service or to make them a Christian won't happen. If you love the world more than you love the Lord, then you'll be done with camp. And it'll fizzle out before long, and the rain will put out, or the cold will put out the fire, and you'll go back to doing it and hope somebody will recharge your batteries again. But if you want to be different, you can make that change this week. You say, I've done that before, preacher. Not good, then you can go to another level. You can get even better. You can do even more. You can mature even more. It's not this, this I had revival, I went and repented again. And I, okay, well, revival is, is that I don't keep repeating the same behaviors over and over and over. I change. And as you change, you're going to be surprised. You know what will happen? <laughs> the Lord will point out that now that you got that fixed, I'm going to point out some real problems. You never stop growing. Now listen carefully because I need to use a word here that I don't intend to be offensive. When something ceases to grow, it's called retarded. I'm not talking about mental ineptness. I'm not using a slang word that's now been written out of our dictionary because we're afraid of talking about people who are mentally deficient. It simply means that when a plant doesn't grow, no matter how much you fertilize it and pour water to it and do that, if it doesn't bear fruit, even the Lord said, you gotta, you got to cut it down. It's not any good. It's just sucking up all the nutrients and all the minerals and so on and so forth. When a Christian stops growing, it doesn't mean you're not saved. It means that you're retarded in the sense that you're not doing what God put you here to do. Listen, desire, this is where you start, right? Desire the sincere milk of the word. Do you know the rest of the verse? That you may what? You mean he wants me to grow? So, so you know what? I hope you're not having babies yet. And I hope to God you're not fathering babies yet. But when you have babies, well, with the exception of some of the old ones, but... When, when, when you have a baby, as much as you love that baby, what do you want the baby to do? You know what you do right off the bat? You like, man, look how strong that baby is. Got to hold my finger. Can't even hardly pull my finger out. I mean, he's, boy, what a grip that baby's got. And then before long, you're like, and the baby's. Stand up, you know. And then he finally stands up and he starts doing the jumpy, right? It's like, yeah, do them squats, baby. Let's go. Get them legs going. That's what I'm talking about. Work out with that baby bottle. Let's get going, right? And then all of a sudden he's not crawling anymore. And then God forbid that day he gets up and now he's crawling and he's reaching on. It's like, oh, what's happening? He's growing. So while we enjoy him being a baby, now he's getting into things because he's now growing that he didn't get into when he was crawling. So now he has to continue the training. And before long, it's like A, B, C, D, E, F, G. We want him to hurry and learn their alphabet. We got to get him into preschool, 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 preschool. Homeschool, preschool, I'm just saying, you know, the good, the good kind of, right? But, but we want them to hurry because, oh yeah, my kid already knew the timetables when they, by the time they got to preschool. 
That's not my them in the womb. <laughs> you know, they just tap on the belly and let us know what the answer was and that kind of thing. Yeah, we, we know. We listen to Mozart and that kind of stuff. In the belly, you know, that classical music, they come out classically trained. Okay. It's the weirdest thing in the world. You know, when the baby comes out, it's not just how much does it weigh, it's like how long is it? You know, well, it's 22 and a half inches long. What does that even mean? It's long, well, then turn him up. Well, oh, well, now, after, but, but once it stands, it's, now it's gone from being long to tall. I'm six foot three inches long. No, I'm six foot three inches tall. I may have shrunk some now that I'm getting old, but, but that's, do you understand what I'm saying? You have to continue to grow, but you can only grow if you're willing to eat. Uh, here comes the hard part. But you only grow the right way if you eat the proper diet. You can grow this way, or you can grow this way. You can grow strong, or you can grow weak. At least according to Daniel, according to what you eat. Is that a true statement? I, I can't eat donuts all the time and not expect to weigh more than I should weigh. But a little donut every now and then, or cinnamon roll, or ice cream, right? But you can't make a steady diet of it. Your teeth rot. It causes all kinds of other problems. God's diet is the diet that will help you to grow spiritually. So the choice is yours this week. Literally, it boils down to what you want to do. I'll do my best to give you everything that the Lord's given me and try my best to keep your, your attention. I'll do my best to, to try to make it interesting for you and not make it a drag like an algebra class or something like that. But I have been around long enough to understand I can't help you if you don't want help. I sat down with a young girl. This is the last illustration. And Brother Joe, you can come close the service out. I sat down with a young girl one time, and she'd been in a lot of trouble. She'd been involved in a bunch of gangs and done some horrible things. I won't even go into all the stuff she had done. She was only 15 years of age. I knew her since she was about 12, I guess, maybe 11 or 12 years of age. And she came in and she got caught, you know, boosting radios and doing some other stuff. And she'd done some stuff in the, in the gang that she shouldn't have done. And, and so when they got done, the, the juvenile intervention team, the gang unit, got through talking to her and getting all the information from her. I went in to see her again. And I sat down across the table from her and I said, you again. She said, yes, sir. Just as tender, you'd never know she was a gangbanger. I mean, you could see the damage on her, but she's a sweet spirit. She's raised right. And I said, well, why do you think you're here? She thought for a long time. And she goes, I really don't know. And I said, I know why you're here. She goes, I know, because I did bad again. And you told me about the crowd. I was hanging out and this and that. I said, that's not why you're here. I said, you're here because you don't want to get any better. You don't want to pay the price that it's going to take to break away from what's causing you to be here. I said, and if you keep going, ultimately, I know I'm going to go to prison or I'm going to wind up in a coffin. I've heard all the stories. I said, okay. Now, I wish I could tell you, you know, and, and she didn't do right and she wound up in a coffin and I did her funeral. I never saw her again. I don't know where she is. The illustration is this. I sat down and you know what I said to her? The same thing I'm telling you. You're where you are, some of you, because you don't want anybody to help you. Your pastors have tried to help you. Your pastor's wives have tried to help you. Other people have tried to help you. But you're too daggum stubborn. You won't listen. And if that's what you want to do this week, I won't spend any time trying to help you if you don't want help. It's like BBs on a rubber tire. It ain't going to make a mark. But you trust me when I tell you, even as inept as I am, if you want God to help you this week, I can assure you he will answer that prayer for you. Put it to the test and see if I'm telling the truth. Come see me on Friday if you pray and ask God, Lord, I want help. And I want it this week. You put me to the test. And if he doesn't answer that prayer, then we'll square off on Friday, okay? Father, I pray that you'll bless your word. Thank you for the privilege of preaching. Thank you for these kids. Thank you for their attention. Thank you for their willingness to come. I pray, God, that you might help us this week to set ourselves apart, to learn the lessons from old Nehemiah, that we got some walls that are broken down and some gates that are burned. 
And I pray, Lord, that you might please help us in these matters to get something from you. Help these kids for this week to be different because they chose to be involved. And we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. start as we've seen youth camp is an opportunity an opportunity that has to be seized on your part and that's what we heard tonight thank God for it what a good way to start camp this week what we're going to do now is again being respectful uh, we're going to go ahead and be dismissed you guys can go uh, to the cabins we got some uh, stuff on the schedule for this evening as far as scheduled events starting at uh, 9 30 uh, Snack Shack will be open here in a little bit, but uh, we're going to go ahead and pray, have you all be dismissed, and you guys can file out and, and get ready for this evening. All right? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you, Lord, for allowing us again to be here tonight. Lord, thankful, uh, Lord God, for the message in which we've heard, the admonishment, Lord, to look inwardly, and Lord, to seize an opportunity that's before us, uh, Lord God, to take care of some things. 
Uh, Lord, I pray, Lord, that these that are here would take that opportunity seriously. We thank you now again uh, for everything. Pray that you bless this evening. Keep everybody safe in the activities. And Lord, we just again pray that you'd meet with us this week. And we ask it in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.